here is another view. Some Russian ships. No doubt HMS Suffolk was somewhere near here, and then rather appropriately a World War II submarine here. I'm not going to film for too long in case somebody thinks this is a bad idea. So the Russians are right there, I suppose, to be proud of their achievement of building this thing uh, a century ago. And a fairly magnificent building. I'm not sure what style we'd call this. Gothic, I don't know. It's impressive. Well, I thought it appropriate to film this steam engine because it would have been something like this engine here that would have been <coughs> dragging Tom Jemison's train from Vladivostok to Perm. This is a rather magnificent engine. No idea how old it is. No doubt it'll say somewhere. A bit like the Wild West, really. Oh, well, there is something here. 1941 to 1945, so maybe maybe this train was a bit more modern, although I rather doubt it. This could be our train arriving, but we don't know which is platform one. But there is no other train that looks remotely like the Trans-Siberian Express. I'll let you know what that says. We're live. Well, this is the trans Arabian Express, just arrived behind us. We've been shooed off it by the, um, I think the name is Matruska or Petroska or something, because we've arrived too early, but never mind. Now, there's a very large truck coming there, which is a great transmission for a moment. days earlier, because this is um, probably about the 18th of April here, he'd been here about the 6th of April, setting off from this platform with his 12 pounders, with his 6 inch gun, and they were going this way, 4,000 miles or more, to the time of Perm. I must say, we have a, a degree of uncertainty what's going to happen to us, but uh, nothing compared to what he had to face uh, in the height of a very unpleasant civil war. Uh, back in 1919. More later. And we're off. Leaving Vladivostok, Pete with band playing on the public press system. There's Martin loafing on his pit. But he's found Wi-Fi, so he's happy. <laughs> and this is our pit. It's fairly narrow beds, quite firm, but actually we're all right because we can stow our bags underneath. And uh, it could be worse. What we really want to know is: is the restaurant open at 10:30 at night? So this is the next morning after leaving Vladivostok. We've absolutely no idea where we are. Um, but this is one of the a stop I'm told for 10 minutes. Uh, it is far too hot inside the train. We tried to get them to turn the heating down. On the other hand, out here, it's probably just about freezing, so I'm not quite sure I'm going to stay around here for too long. Uh, we are being offered delicacies like fish. And, uh, this is caviar of some sort or other. But uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to be buying it but uh, we might be tempted next time. I guess it's smoked fish, so we could actually use, eat it direct. Well, it's still Tuesday, the day after Vladivostok, and this is the scene, mile after mile, 100 mile after 100 mile, every now and then a small village of houses with no paint, looking rather down at heel, and then every now and then into a larger town, we know we're very close to the Chinese border at the moment. Uh, Martin put on his GPS to give us some idea of where we got to, because uh, we couldn't follow ourselves uh, on the map. 
This obviously is an area that's been cleared. I assume this is a field that will eventually bear something after the great frost has gone. In grandfather's time, it was a lot colder, although it was at least uh, 10 days earlier in the year. And they'd been warned of temperatures of minus 30. Well, when we got on the, out of the platform, it was probably just above freezing. Cold enough, but uh, certainly not as cold as what they faced then. 20-minute leg stretch in Kabarosk. It's a pretty dull place. Uh, a sort of Clapham Junction, although we've been going through a railway marketing yard that are absolutely enormous. It's obviously a very, very big city. And here we are, Lake Baikal. Baikal. We have arrived. Suddenly, we're alongside this lake, and of course, we can see it is still frozen. The great in the water of this lake, you have the secret of eternal youth. Right now, I think it would be the secret of a quick death. <laughs> Still, it's attractive. So, this is the entry into Irkutsk. And somewhere up here, there's where Admiral Kolchak met his death. Although it was on another arm of the river, possibly from this one. But with the sun shining, no ice or snow in sight, it all looks really quite pleasing. People fishing. I guess that might be the center, I don't know. So this is it. We have finally arrived at Omsk, saying by goodbye to the dear lady who's been looking after us. Thank you very much. And we have Galina, or was it Elia, here? Galina. Oh, just Galina. Ah, oh, right. Okay. And uh, this is the start, or the next stage, of our big adventure. So how are you feeling, Martin? <laughs> Ready for the fray? Yep. Uh, and just for the camera's record, this of course is Omsk, where uh, the head of the white Russian government uh, was situated, Admiral Kolchak uh, and all the rest. But over here, an item of interest is Admiral Kolchak himself. It looks quite a good likeness, actually, sitting here in his role as supreme leader for the short period that he ruled that part of Russia that was not being dominated by the, uh, the Reds. This is the house we were looking at. Uh, and here is the picture of the house that we were looking at. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Martin, anything else that you can point out? These the admirals. That's his picture. There are his medals, as you can see on ah, there. Ah, his medals. Yes, he was... That's his wife. Or maybe mistress, actually, well, came with him. Well, it's a good point. I think his family were in the southern Russia. Is that wife or mistress? Mike. No. So this is mistress. Oh, his mistress. That was Tatiana. Along, yeah. Is that Tatiana? Who? Timirova. Uh, Timirova. Thank Timirora. you. Who, who we see died in 1975. So she escaped because she was with him when he was shot. She accompanied him.